So the character of John the Baptist shows up sporadically throughout all of the gospel stories of Jesus. And so for the sake of today, we're going to try to put all of those stories of John together to create a composite picture of this man as we explore today's beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So John is a descendant in a long line of priests. We learn in Luke's gospel that John's parents are elderly, the elderly priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. They are old, past childbearing years, and yet Elizabeth becomes pregnant, so his very birth into the world is a miracle. On the day of John's circumcision, his father sings this song that John will be the one to prepare the way for the Messiah. John will go out into the wilderness to make ready the way of the Lord. We also learn from Luke that John is related to Jesus. Mary and Elizabeth are relatives of some kind, um, and so John is just a few months older than Jesus, and he's related to Jesus. The next time we hear about John, he's in the wilderness. He's living off of locusts and wild honey. He's wearing camel's hair. There are all kinds of echoes in that description of the old Hebrew prophets. And so John is in the wilderness. He's sounding like Daniel or Nahum or Malachi, preparing for the day of the Lord's judgment. And droves of people come to hear John the Baptist, to be baptized, cleansed of their sins, so that they're ready to welcome the judgment day of the Lord. And Jesus himself shows up at the Jordan River, and John baptizes cousin Jesus in the water. The heavens burst open, a dove descends, and the voice declares that Jesus is God's beloved son. And that's the story that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Specifically to Matthew, though, is a recognition that John has some idea at the baptism of Jesus who Jesus is. You should be baptizing me, John says. So there's an illusion there that John knows who Jesus is. In the gospel of John, there's no doubt that John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. The first time that Jesus is introduced in John's gospel, the Baptist cries out, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's no ambiguity here. John the Baptist is fulfilling the role that was declared for him at his birth. So time passes. Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's healing. And at one point, John the Baptist is having some questions about what Jesus is doing. So he sends some of his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one, are you the Messiah, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus sends John's disciples back with this message. The lame walk, the blind see, the poor have good news brought to them. Which leaves us wondering, why was John so worried about Jesus' identity? Why did John have these doubts? We don't really know, but we have some guesses. There is an ancient Jewish historian. His name was Josephus. Not to be confused with Bocephus, that's Hank Williams Jr., but Josephus, the ancient historian. Anyway, um, Josephus writes an exhaustive history of the Jewish people, and Josephus writes about, he knows about John the Baptist. Now, Josephus is not a Christian. He is a Jew writing a history of the Jews, but John the Baptist is prominent enough that he makes Josephus's history. And according to Josephus, John the Baptist had a large number of people who followed him. In fact, according to Josephus, more people were following John the Baptist around at this time than were actually following Jesus around. So perhaps John the Baptist was looking at the number of people that came to hear his sermons, and then he was hearing reports of how many people came to hear Jesus' sermons, and he was worried about Jesus' worship attendance numbers. But ultimately, in the end, after getting the message back from Jesus' disciples and Jesus, Uh, John remains true to that mission that he was given. We see the climax of that in our reading for today. 
According to what Josephus says about John, uh, Herod knows that, that John has these crowds listening to him, and Herod sees John as a threat. There is only room for one leader and one crowd in Jerusalem. Here's how Josephus describes it. Now when many others came to crowd about him, for they were greatly moved by hearing John's words, Herod, who feared lest the great influence John had over the people, might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed to do anything he should advise, thought it best by putting him to death to prevent any mischief he might cause and not bring himself into difficulties by sparing a man who might make him repent of it when it should be too late. You see, John offers equal opportunity repentance. He's come all the way to the most powerful man in the land with his message because Herod's family is a mess. Herodias, who is his niece by a half-brother, is married to another half-brother of Herod. But Herod meets her and convinces her to leave her husband and come to marry him. Because, you know, he's the king. And kings should be able to do whatever they want and, and not answer for the consequences of their actions. Those who have the power just get to make the rules, right? They don't have to follow them. But John comes to say, oh, that's not the case at all. You, the king, too, answer to a higher power than yourself, and that is the reign of God, and there is a commandment that says a man cannot marry his brother's wife. Herod hears John, and Herod is not at all interested in repentance, and he doesn't like the size of the crowd who've come with John as he ventures up to the palace, and so Herod has John thrown in jail. And thus we get to the story of the birthday party and the dancing and the beheading and the dinner plate. But through it all, John doesn't fear. The one to whom he has given his life is more important than anything else that might threaten him. John is one of the hashtag blessed who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. His tireless dedication to proclaiming the way of the Lord ends in his martyrdom. And what I find so fascinating when you look at a composite picture of the wild man John is that he has no reason that he needs to be this voice crying out for Jesus. John's from a prominent family, a long line of priests in the capital city. He could fall in line with the family profession of the priesthood, work his way up the ladder of success, buy the summer house on the Sea of Galilee. But that's not his purpose. John also is charismatic. Droves of people come to hear him speak. He has more followers than Jesus. He could plant a megachurch. He could sell vials of holy water from the Jordan River to gullible people on infomercials. He could, he could buy expensive shoes and watches and write best-selling books about the coming kingdom of God. He could get a regular spot on TV. But he never, John never lets his rhetorical ability or the power of his speech detract from the subject of his proclamation. And third, John is powerful. Josephus sees it. John is seen as a threat to Herod. John could mount a coup with his followers, take over the throne, rebuild Judea after the ways of the Torah. But instead, he comes to the powerful ruler to remind him that that ruler answers to another power, that he is subject to the reign of God, and the sword strikes him down. The last thing is, John is the older one. So all over the Bible, in the Genesis especially, there's these stories of older brothers and younger brothers. And I know that John and Jesus aren't brothers, but according to Luke, they're relatives. So there's an illusion here. 
And so in the Old Testament, in the Genesis stories, God always favors the younger brother, and the older brother or brothers never like that. So Cain murders his brother Abel. Esau seeks vengeance on his younger brother Jacob. Joseph's brothers are so upset with him, they throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery. But not so with John. John is different. John, from the beginning, is willing for the elder to serve the younger. And because of all these things, I think John gives us a model, even today. Because John doesn't see Jesus as a means to an end. John already has a comfortable, secure, human, earthly existence. There's nothing he needs to get from Jesus on this earth that he doesn't already have. But that wouldn't be faithful. He has been called to proclaim the Messiah with everything he has. And so John uses all of his gifts and abilities to put forward that message even to the point of persecution and death. He sees in Jesus not a hope for his personal gain, but for the opportunity for the recreation of the whole world. He sees in Jesus the mercy, forgiveness, patience, and kindness of God that can heal divisions. John has seen that the hand of God rests on Jesus to free us from our sin and our selfishness, and our violent addictions. And so John uses his pedigree, this long line of priests, to preach that message of Jesus. He draws on his pedigree for the sake of proclaiming Jesus. John uses his charisma to gather big crowds, not to promote himself, but to point them to his younger cousin, Jesus. John uses his power to confront the injustice of the world so that Jesus might be ready to make all things new. John himself says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Eric Koble, in his chapter on this beatitude, says, To be good with God can often mean to be at odds with society, friends, even family, and that's something that comes easily to no one. It means being true to the very core of who you are as a child of God, living in accordance with the dictates of a soul that has been enriched by faith and informed by conscience which in turn means rubbing against the grain of someone or some group made uncomfortable by the extent to which those dictates countermand their own. So John is asking us, are you pointing the world to Jesus? And maybe you want to do that. Maybe your life has been captured by the words and the life of this rabbi, but you don't know how to take that next step. I want to be your follower of Jesus, but I don't know what to do. John gives us a roadmap. John gives us a roadmap. What's your background? Do you draw on your family legacy and your family story in order to make yourself sound important to other people? Do you draw on your family story to make up excuses for why in life you're always a failure? Or are you able to draw on your origin story as the space where God first began to call you into a life of discipleship? We can see those glimmers of the Holy Spirit from the beginning calling us into holy service. What about your social connections? Are our social connections the ways that we use to make ourselves look better for others so we can hoard likes and hearts and, and get all the juicy gossip? Or are our social connections the spaces where we can pursue justice, challenge with mercy, and grow in gratitude? 
And how about our power? Or your advocacy, or your vote, or your letter writing, or your lobbying, or those power lunches, or those intended just to kiss the ring of the king, or to remind yourself and others that we answer to a sovereign one, a different king who washed feet and touched lepers and mounted a cross and whose crown was wound out of thorns. Does our use of power point to that humble servant life of Jesus? Jesus promises in this beatitude, if you draw on your background, if you use your social connections, if you wield your power in a way that it points the world to Jesus, you're going to suffer some. You're going to suffer some. You'll at least look a bit odd, if not be outright rejected by those who've decided that self-promotion and getting ahead is their God, not righteousness and living a life in love for your neighbor. But what you'll find What John knew in part in this life and discovered wholly in his death is that the witness to the reign of God and a commitment to the kingdom of heaven outweighs all self-absorbed pleasure, wealth, status, or power. It doesn't match the neighbor's definition, but it is a life that is truly hashtag blessed. Amen.